Hi and welcome to the first session of the Building a Virtual Machine class. My name is Dmitry Soshnikov and I'll be teaching this class. And just to set the agenda, this is purely a practical class. We will discuss just a few amount of theory, however, most of the lectures will be actual practical exercises. Right, building a virtual machine from scratch. And for those of you who have taken the Essential Software Interpretation class, uh, this will be natural next step. And from the AST interpreter, which we have implemented in the previous class, yeah, we will be moving down to the low level and we'll implement a stack-based virtual machine. As you can see, this class has almost twice as many lectures as the previous class. And it also has the prerequisites. Now, first of all, we need to have the basic C++ experience. However, we will not be using two specific C++ constructs, so if you don't have any C++ experience, uh, you still might follow the lectures. And the first thing we need to say, this is not a class about C++. Right? We will not be using two specific C++ features, and uh, we'll be operating with a very simple constructs. Uh, for example, uh, this for loop, which is pretty much the same in any programming language, uh, this is exactly what we'll be using. Um, in contrast, for example, with the for each from the algorithm in the C++. So you may port this implementation to any other language. Uh, the most complex construct from C++ probably will be just pointers. Uh, if you're not familiar, a pointer just keeps the address. And the reason why we need pointers, because virtual machines operate with uh, different types of pointers, for example, stack pointer, uh, instruction pointer, uh, frame pointer, etc. So if you have a variable using the ampersand operator in C++, you can get it address. And the pointer is nothing but the address of the variable uh, where the value is stored. And for those of you who are not familiar with the memory concept, you may treat it as just the giant array of bytes, right? Uh, where indices of this array are called addresses, and we can store values at those addresses, at those indices. So simple array. And so there is also inverse operation to get value from the pointer using the star operator. Right? So if we apply the star on px, we get 10. That is the value stored at this address. Now, we will not be even using any build system, right? Not the make, cmake, etc. We'll be using just plain header files, not even splitting implementation from the declaration. And there will be just one single C++ file. Again, this is not a class about C++, rather about virtual machine concepts. So we try to make build and the code very simple. In fact, that's the only command we'll be using, standard clank utility, passing the main C++ file, and specifying the output. And then we can execute the output, passing either the uh, direct expression or the pass to file. Uh, but of course, we may use some specific flags for clank, for example, standard C++17, uh, enabling warnings and enabling the debugger support. Now, since we have a lot of lectures here in this class, we will not be using the test-driven development as we did in previous courses, um, just to save time. So, uh, if we encounter some problems, some bugs or issue, we will be debugging them as we go. Uh, but please, as you follow, consider implementing the unit tests uh, for specific modules. You may use simple asserts from C++ or GTS, Google Test, or any other framework. And also, as we said, we want to make this transferable, uh, for example, to Rust or any other low-level language. And for example, you may just mimic the heap, the memory, um, by leveraging the uh, typed arrays, right? Using the byte array. This is exactly represents the storing value at memory and getting it uh, by its pointer. So in this case, we really see the pointer just the index in this array. Uh, but C++ makes it the most convenient working with memory. Uh, it provides direct raw access to memory. Uh, and also, it will be more convenient to implement a JIT compiler. Uh, however, again, you may implement everything here in any other language. Now, the second requirement is the Essentials of Interpretation class. Unless you're familiar already with concepts of um, closures, uh, environments, scope chain, identify resolution, how eval works, etc., etc., that is how the runtime works at AST level, you have to take uh, Essentials of Interpretation class. Uh, where we built uh, a full interpreter for a programming language uh, at AST level, at higher level, and then come back to this class as the natural extension. So these are two prerequisites, and let's get started. In the previous class, we mentioned that we distinguish languages on interpreted and compiled. And in fact, it's not the languages, but the implementations. And we also said that the runtime semantics is defined exactly by interpreters. Right? Specifically, interpreters tells and answer the questions what it means to define a variable, what it means to define a function, how function is called, etc., etc. And the compilers, they do not execute any programs. Uh, they just translate from one language to another. 
right? hoping that there is an interpreter for that target language. In fact, they delegate semantics to the target language. Uh, so just to demonstrate it, uh, let's say we have the program P1 written in some language. Then in order to get the output of this program, we always need an interpreter. And there is no other way we can get the output for the program P1. However, let's say we don't have interpreter for this program. Let's say it's just a new language. Uh, in this case, you may choose to implement a compiler from P1 to the semantically equivalent program P2. Uh, again, hoping that there is an interpreter for that P2 program and to get the same result. And at the very low level, such interpreter really exists and it's called the CPU itself. Right? So if you have the code in your programming language and you translate it, that is compile, to native code, uh, you can be sure that the CPU will be able to execute it. So in this class, we'll be working specifically with the interpreters, that is the virtual machines, and we'll have um, in both implementations. We'll, we'll have the compiler from the source code to the bytecode, right? pretty much from the P1 to P2, and then implementing the interpreter, that is the virtual machine itself. And just to remind previous implementation, let's quickly see how the AST interpreter works. As we said, it defines the high-level semantics. And here's the classic parsing pipeline, which we have been discussing in the previous lectures. Um, let's say we have the simple program, print hello. And the first module, which meets our program, is known as tokenizer. That is the lexical analysis. And the idea here is to group individual characters into stream of tokens. And just for more convenient work, instead of working with uh, single characters, we work with words. In this case, we have two tokens, uh, identifier with the value print and the string with the value hello. Now, the tokenizer doesn't make any commitment whether our program is syntactically valid. Uh, for this, we have parser. Uh, however, besides the validation, parser produces the next intermediate representation known as abstract syntax tree, or the AST. And so this representation is already suitable to pass to the compiler or to the interpreter and to obtain the result. Now, when we discuss runtime semantics, we don't work much with parsers. Uh, the topic of parsing might be completely separate from the runtime implementation. For the same runtime, you may have multiple syntaxes. So if you're interested in parsing specifically, um, you may consider taking two classes, building a parser from scratch, where we build a manual recursive descent parser, or you may even take the essentials of parsing class, um, more theoretical when we talk about syntactic analysis theory, uh, and implement automated parser using parser generator tool. Uh, at the AST, the way we implement it, we just directly passed the uh, AST to the interpreter. And by traversing it, we obtain the correct result. Plain simple. Again, you may implement full programming language at this level. Potentially, there is no need to go to the low-level implementation. For example, you may have simple DSL. Uh, please choose to implement it at the AST. Here's the example. When we have the source code and obtain the AST after parsing, we just directly pass it to the interpreter. And also we said there might be multiple AST formats. For example, in the parsers class, um, we used the explicit JSON format with the explicit type property for each node. Now let's see what we have in the bytecode interpreter. So the bytecode interpreter, also known as virtual machine, uh, has a couple of more extra steps during the compilation, and it also fundamentally changes the runtime data structures. So here, after obtaining the AST, uh, we pass it at the static time, at the compile time, uh, to the module which is called bytecode emitter, or simply a compiler. And this emitter produces the next intermediate representation, known as the bytecode. And uh, in this case, it looks like it's a bytecode for the stack machine, uh, as we will see shortly in this class. So here we have two instructions pushing the value hello onto the stack and calling the print function. And then this bytecode is passed to the interpreter again, uh, to the virtual machine, and we obtain exactly the same result. Now, why do we need this again? Why not just interpret at the AST as we did previously? Well, when you have uh, a production level, uh, very generic programming language, you need to make it fast. At the AST level, the structure of a program was represented exactly as a tree, which already takes a lot of space and might be slower in the evaluation loop. And while in the bytecode, we have just plain array of bytes, which is much faster to interpret and takes less space. So let's take a look at this example. We have the source code in the S expression format. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with S expression, it's a syntax of languages such as Scheme, Lisp, and many others, and it's pretty naturally represent the AST. In fact, in the previous interpreter class, we've just used simple JavaScript arrays, which map one-to-one -to, -one, uh, to the S expression, right? We have just 
uh, more quotes, commas here, but these arrays represent exactly the AST uh, structure of the program. So we were able to skip the parsing stage altogether and start writing the interpreter. However, as we said, it takes too much memory, right? Allocation of these arrays, strings, etc., makes a larger program to consume much more memory. In addition, everything is evaluated at runtime, right? Everything. For example, if we need to resolve variable x, we have to traverse the full environment chain until we find it. And when we access x second time, we do this over and over again. So the evaluation loop becomes very slow. Now let's see what the bytecode proposes. So in contrast with all this array allocation, etc., this equivalent program in the bytecode much smaller. We do store extra data structures, but still, once it's precompiled to the bytecode, it takes less memory. Now, in addition to, we precompile as much as possible at the uh, compilation time, right? Instead of evaluating the variable x, say, in the environment chain, we know exactly in which environment it exists and know exactly the index in that environment, so we can directly jump and get its value. So the evaluation becomes much faster. This is why all the production-level virtual machines today use exactly the uh, bytecode implementation and pre-compilation and uh, optimizations before we hit the runtime. Now, one problem, this representation becomes much harder to read for humans, since this is optimized for the machine. So that's why, to understand what's happening inside of this bytecode, we will need to have a disassembler. So here we see the memory addresses where the bytecode is located. Uh, we see the bytecode itself, still the same bytes and then textual representation uh, known as the assembly. Assembly language, um, as you can see, this assembler was able to deconstruct these bytes into specific instructions, for example, constant with the index 0 for value 15, getting the variable x, etc. And as you can see, it has pre-calculated index 0, so it knows exactly without any runtime resolution where the variable x uh, lives. And we should also say, in this class, we use custom bytecode, which we invented. And what is the case for many uh, virtual machines today? They all provide custom bytecode. And also, this class is exactly about the virtual machines, so we need to understand how the actual uh, bytecode interpretation works. Uh, however, there is also a way to reuse existing production-level bytecode, which is provided by the LLVM framework. Uh, however, for the LLVM, we'll have a separate class called Programming Language with LLVM. And again, in this class, we focus on the custom bytecode. Uh, which looks very similar to the Python bytecode. Okay, so with this being said, please meet Eva, or meet again for those who have taken the uh, interpreter's class. Again, Eva is the dynamic programming language, similar to Python or JavaScript. It supports functional programming and object-oriented, uh, closures, lambda functions, uh, and for syntax, as we said, we're going to use again as expression. Here's the examples. In this case, it's plus operator, set instruction, uh, or if for the if expression. As you can see, the if is also a complex expression. Inside it has other sub-expressions. And here's one more example for the function declaration. As you can see, we use the def keyword, borrowed from Python. Uh, we're also going to support lambda functions, or anonymous functions. And also we'll be able to call a lambda right after the declaration. Right? We create the function and immediately apply it. So called immediately invoked lambda expressions. So this is pretty much it. Without further introduction, let's jump directly to the implementation. So I'm creating the directory for our project, Eva VM. And let's start from the virtual machine class, evavm.h. As we said, we'll be using just header files with direct implementation in the header files. Right? For actual C++, it's not the best uh, way of implementing everything in the H files. Uh, usually you split declaration in the header and implementation in C++, but again, we don't focus on C++ much here. Now we'll be using standard uh, guards for the header files, so this header is included only once. So we represent a virtual machine as a class, where the main API method is the exec. Right? We accept the program as the string, and for this we include the string header. And here's what should happen inside the exec. Well, first of all, we need to parse this program into AST. Uh, as we said, we don't focus on parsers too much, so we'll just have uh, a simple parser for S expressions, and this will be happening later in the course. Then we have to compile the parsed AST into the bytecode, right? and then start executing the uh, evaluation loop for the bytecode. Uh, for now, we'll just be creating the code directly uh, and manually, just to see the process from inside, and later we will implement the parser and the compiler. So what is bytecode? Now the bytecode is just a set of bytes. That's exactly what we have. An array or vector 
which contains uh, unsigned integers. And we need to know which exact byte we analyze at the moment. So virtual machines, and actually real machines, have the pointer known as instruction pointer, right, which points exactly um, to the currently evaluating instruction. So the standard name for this pointer is IP, instruction pointer. Sometimes it's called uh, PC, program counter, uh, but we'll use the IP here, uh, as it's called, for example, an Intel architecture. And to start evaluating, we need to set the IP to the first byte of the byte code. Right? So we uh, take the first byte, and as we said, we apply the ampersand operator to get the address. Remember, the pointers uh, store the addresses. And we define this pointer inside our class as exactly a pointer pointing to the byte. And then, as previously, we just have the eval function, pretty much the core of any interpreter. Uh, in contrast with the AST interpreter, the eval is not recursive here. It's just the infinite loop. Right? Let's write it as the infinite for loop. Uh, which should analyze the current byte and uh, behave accordingly, right? For specific instruction, it executes specific handling procedure, pretty much the same as we did at the AST interpreter. Now, the set of the bytecode instructions is known as the instruction set. And today we're going to have only one instruction, which is called halt. And we encode it with the first byte, let's say number zero. The encoding might be completely arbitrary, uh, but we'll be just using the increasing numbers, so the halt instruction has the bytecode zero. And then let's manually create the current bytecode, which contains only one instruction, the halt instruction. Now, the halt instruction, as we said, should stop the program. And inside the interpretation loop, we need to read the next byte. So let's introduce this function, read byte. And then we check if it's the halt instruction, we just return. Right, we're done. Okay, that should be it for the first instruction. Uh, let's create the main virtual machine executable, the only C file we're going to have. Right, let's create the instance, and for this we need to include the header, and then just call the exec method. And we will be passing the actual program uh, to the exec. And today we have only the halt instruction, but going forward, uh, the actual program will go here. Uh, as we said, to compile we're going to use Clank, Clank++. Uh, I have version 11 for the Apple. Please address uh, documentation for your version. You may use GCC or Clank or Windows version. Uh, again, we'll be using very plain C++ in construction, so it should work for any type of compiler. Again, we use the C++17 standard here, enable all warnings, and enable the debugger support. Then we specify the path to the C++ file, and tell that output should be EVA VM executable. Let's compile. Okay, the first problem. Uh, now, first of all, we're going to have a lot of such uh, compilation errors. This is not the problem, we need to follow them and fix. Uh, this also might be a good exercise for those of you who are not familiar with C++, just how to debug, to see the errors. And in this case, we actually forgot to define the read byte macro, so let's do this. So the read byte function, or the macro in this case, should read the current byte uh, in the instruction pointer, right? And then increase the instruction pointer to point to the next byte. This is exactly what we do. We uh, read the value using the star operator. Remember, if we apply the star to a pointer, we get the value. And then we increase it with plus plus. All right, that should be it. Let's execute. And it works. We don't see any output, but it's exactly the correct uh, evaluation because we didn't stack in the infinite loop of the eval. Uh, for example, try changing the uh, halt up code from zero to, uh, say, FF value. And in this case, you should stack in the for loop. So that's it for today. That's the introduction lecture. We have started building the virtual machine. I talked about the bytes, the bytecode, instruction pointers, instruction set. And in the next lectures, we'll start talking about numbers and mathematical operations going further to strings, to objects, functions, etc. Okay, thanks and see you in the class.